Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash i5. Hello, party people and people who like partying a little bit. Welcome to the latest episode of i5 for the iPhone. This is the show for us, the iPhone fans. And every week we'll cover five topics, from the apps you must have to the news you must know, and we'll try to throw in a few tips and tricks along the way. Onward! Number one. If you do a lot of shopping online, like I do, you know how attractive the idea of same-day shipping sounds. But infrastructure-wise, it's not always easy to pull off, even for the biggest of companies. In fact, just last month, Amazon's chief financial officer told analysts, we don't really see a way to do same-day delivery on a broad scale economically. Although the company is experimenting with same-day service in some U.S. cities. And now, so is eBay at least in San Francisco. The app is called eBay Now, it's in beta, and I have it downloaded on my iPhone, so let's take a look. The home screen has a few purchase suggestions, like the Mophie iPhone battery pack, I like the way you think, eBay. A list of partner stores like Target and Nordstrom, and popular searches by others, which apparently includes pigs and Sanders. Hey, I'm not one to judge. The layout feels a little funky at first because I was looking for a browsing experience and it's not really much of one, at least by store. So if I go to Nordstrom, for example, the featured items all over the place. eBay now works much better if you know specifically what you want and you search for just that. So for example, let's say my house is a mess, I've got people coming over for dinner, and my vacuum just broke. A quick search, and I've got a ton of vacuum options, variety of prices, I don't need to worry about what store it's even coming from, and an eBay courier can bring it to my house in as little as an hour. eBay now works with orders of $25 or more and adds a $5 delivery fee on top of your total, which is more reasonable than the delivery fees I've paid other courier services to bring me stuff. But then again, it's all about the retail partners. eBay now isn't gonna help you with an impulse order of pizza and ice cream, but it will keep you from having to get in the car and drive down to Best Buy, again, if you live in San Francisco. If this trial period goes well in San Francisco, I do see eBay now expanding to other urban markets, the kind of places where there's a lot of potential demand for convenient services in a very concentrated area. I'm also curious to see if they can hold on to that low $5 delivery fee or if the number starts to creep up over time. If you're interested, you can sign up for the beta at now.ebay.com. Number two, when I first heard that the New Yorker magazine was finally coming to the iPhone, I was not that excited. Not because I don't like the magazine, I actually think it's great, but because I prefer the size of my iPad, which is closer to the size of a magazine page. It's just a preference. But what's nice is that for anybody who's already familiar with the New Yorker's iPad app layout, the iPhone app works very similar. Once you've downloaded an issue, you can flip through the pages and pass the ads, kind of a lot of ads, in a linear way, in order, like you would with a magazine, or you can jump around. Just tap the screen for the menu icon, choose your story, and away you go. The back button has come in handy for me to revert back to the page I was already reading previously. It'll save your space, too, if it's a long article. Or you could scrub through the pages visually, although they load up a little bit slowly, and my Wi-Fi network is pretty fast, and the page thumbnails are almost too small to be that helpful. If you're not already a New Yorker reader, once you download the app, which is free and goes into your newsstand, you also get two free issues. So if you read those issues and you like it, the content ends up appealing to you. A one month subscription is $5.99 or a year is $59.99. What's nice is that in your iOS store settings, you can choose to automatically download new content when you're on a Wi-Fi connection, so you don't really have to think about it. Now, because I already subscribed to The New Yorker via my iPad, I should be able to restore previous purchases. This is not working for me on the iPhone app. And judging by some of the complaints on the App Store, the app is buggy for a lot of folks. Hopefully that's something that will be patched up soon. In the meantime, for New Yorker fans, this is a great complement to the iPad app or the magazine, if not so much a standalone experience. Number three. 
There's been a lot of talk lately about passwords and keeping them secure and what happens when you don't. Luckily, i5 co-host of the week, Steve Conklin, is looking out for us. I use my iPhone to keep numbers handy at the touch of a button. For example, I've got my kids' social security numbers on my phone. But I wouldn't want my phone to fall in the wrong hands if it were to be stolen. So I use a piece of software called mSecure from M7 Software. It's a password manager for all of your iOS devices. It basically keeps my important numbers handy on my phone by locking them away with only access through a password of my choice. It's got all the top data security encryption built in, and you can sync with a cloud service if you'd like, or even Dropbox. Even sync your important info via your own Wi-Fi network so that your data is safe on all of your devices. The thing I like about this app is it's really simple to use once you get all your information entered in. For example, if I was at the club and needed my locker combination, I could get it quickly by launching the app, entering a password, and then touching the lock combo category that I created and named myself. Sure, there's my combo. It's time for a workout. There's a lot more this app can do, but if you wanted just a simple way to keep those important numbers handy but secure, then this app is for you. It's a bit pricey at $9.99, but for convenience and security, what price would you pay? Again, that's mSecure, a great password manager. Sarah, back to you. Thanks, Steve. mSecure looks great in putting information the first time I found a little cumbersome, but then you're organized. Once you're done, and with Dropboxing functionality, my info is always with me. By the way, mSecure says that iCloud Sync is coming in the fall as well. The latest version, which is 3.0, also adds categorization for multiple groups and more icon choices than you would ever need, really. If you have a text document somewhere on your computer with a list of passwords, logins, frequent flyer numbers, and codes, and you know who you are, you're also a good candidate to spend $10 for mSecure. Before we get to number four, this episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by Audible. Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles. If you're looking for a particular book, Audible has literature, fiction, nonfiction, even periodicals. For i5 viewers, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. One audiobook you may enjoy from the bestseller list is Gone Girl, it's a whodunit murder mystery. To download this audiobook for free or another one of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash i5. That's audiblepodcast.com slash i5. Numero quattro. Hopefully, if you're watching i5, you're also a fan of another show I host called iPad Today here on the Twit Network. New episodes every Thursday. Well, one of our reoccurring segments is something we like to call a da tip. This is that feature or the setting or the shortcut that maybe you stumble upon one day by accident or somebody shows you and you say to yourself, duh, why didn't I know about this? I think there's plenty of room for some duh tips on i5 as well. In fact, Steve from the Czech Republic emailed us with a good one. He writes, I have, like many, played around with Siri at the beginning, but slowly stopped using it until I realized that holding the phone to my ear at any time will activate Siri, allowing me to do all the cool things that Siri is capable of. You don't have to think about activating it, just hold up the phone and talk to him. I use the British English Siri, which is a male voice, of course. Yes, Steve, you are right, you can do this. By default, if you have Siri turned on, you press and hold down the home button in order to pull Siri up to activate it. And that works fine, but since you're going to be talking into the phone anyway, why not just raise it up to your ear and speak naturally without having to hold down a button at all? Just turn raise to speak on in your Siri settings and you're good to go. By the way, I've really tried to stump Siri on this. Your phone really knows when it's right next to your ear and when it isn't. Number five. Last week we got word that iOS 6 will no longer include a native YouTube app. Both Apple and Google, who owns YouTube, have downplayed this being some sort of a drama between the rivals. Both companies say that they'll continue to work together to bring the best YouTube experience to the iPhone, which is what they would say anyway. But I think you can probably expect a better YouTube app and a YouTube app that actually gets updated and gets new features more often because Google will be submitting it through the App Store rather than being at the mercy of Apple's own iOS cycle. But here's some more interesting iOS 6 news. 
it's been rumored for ages that the next-gen iPhone will have a bigger screen, but bigger overall. Well, the folks over at 9to5Mac noticed while they were running an iOS simulator in the developer beta that if you crank up the display resolution to 640 by 1136, the screen allows for five rows of icons rather than the current four rows that this little 3.5-inch screen allows. So does that mean that we can absolutely, positively expect a bigger iPhone? No, not definitely. Definitively, but it does prove that Apple is designing iOS 6 to be able to scale to a larger screen. And it's probably for their own hardware. That's my thought. I'm hoping we're about to see a bigger iPhone anyway. Four more app slots on our precious home screen real estate. I'm into it. And that wraps up this episode of i5 for the iPhone. Until next time, you can email us at i5 at twit.tv. Leave us a voicemail at 614 on i5. That's 614 O N I F I V E. Or send us a video with an app review of your own. Try to keep it to 60 seconds or less. I promise you it can be done. And thanks in advance. I'm Sarah Lane, and I'll be back with a brand new i5 next week.